Hi again, this is Harold in Beijing. Today on this April 1st, it's a bit warmer than my last video. It's not raining. It was very beautiful uh, blue skies this morning. Now it's a bit overcast, but um, it's, it's still quite comfortable. Spring is definitely coming. Um, on this Friday, tomorrow's a working Saturday. That's a unique thing in China that sometimes when they have public holidays, they will take a, a, a working day to the prior or, or following weekend. So people work on Saturday and get a day off next week in return. That allows them to have then three or four days in a row where they can visit their hometowns if they live not too far away. Uh, the holiday, the public holiday tomorrow is called Qingming Festival, also called Tomb Sweeping Holiday. Um, traditionally, it's, it's the day when people visit the graves of their ancestors to commemorate the dead. Uh, spiritually also the myth is that the ghosts of the ancestors will return to earth so people lay food and, and drink to the graves to placate the, the, uh, the dead uh, also tradition is to burn uh, paper money that symbolizes the wealth that young, like the offspring give their parents in afterlife there's a lot of traditions around it um, I just uh, thought I mentioned this. This channel is not mainly focused on traditional culture. Maybe I'll do more on it, though. It could be interesting. If people are interested, let me know. I'll talk more about these traditional holidays and, and traditions. Uh, what I want to talk about today, to get off a bit from these geopolitical topics, uh, and, and especially given that maybe, at least if you're interested in China, you've probably heard about Shanghai going into lockdown, before that, several other cities went into lockdown because of COVID. I thought I'd give an update on what's happening in China. Uh, and again, to illustrate how big China is, I'm here in Beijing. And as you can see, there's people on the streets. Life goes on as normal. It's not a sense of alarm or calamity. On the contrary, Beijing didn't have any local COVID transmissions in recent days which means that always uh, the, the measures are relaxing somewhat. Although obviously Shanghai is a bit of a shock to the Chinese because it's one of the biggest cities. It's a very modern city. It's um, known to be well managed. Like the city government of Shanghai is well, is known to be, to be very professional, very modern, caring for the people as well. And that's not always the case and definitely in, in, in some poorer regions um, they have difficulty to find top talent, top managers to lead the city government, which can then be felt by the people quite directly. Uh, local governments have a lot of power over the central government. So, so that's something that a lot of people are not aware, but the local government's role in, in people's daily life is, is very important. Waiting for, for the bus to pass here. Um, so... Yeah, also it's in China, that's uh, definitely different than Switzerland, um, but it's calm. It's a, it's a neighborhood uh, a bit far from my home, it takes me about 50, 40 minutes by subway to get here. I had uh, some visa uh, business to do here and I thought I'll just uh, walk around in this region. It's uh, compared to my neighborhood, it's definitely a bit older, it's more to the center of the city. My neighborhood was built in the last decade. This here looks like it's been here at least 20 years. Uh, this, the houses are, are uh, less tall, uh, less high. And um, yeah, it's just uh, otherwise I, I couldn't tell. Like if I didn't know where in Beijing I am, I cannot tell from looking at the streets. There's not no, no like typical flair or typical feeling to different parts of the city, except uh, <laughs> like the main uh, places like the Guomao uh, business district or Tiananmen, obviously that one recognizes. So this is just a random road and a uh, random insight into how life goes on in China. And uh, what I wanted to stress or talk about this time is how after two years of COVID, people in China are still uh, willing and able to accept lockdowns. I know uh, in Europe, I think in the US as well, most places are coming out of lockdowns, are coming out of COVID measures now, and people would just not take it well if governments announced to get back into uh, stricter regulation. 
And I think the main difference that a lot of people don't understand is that we have been living basically almost normal lives for the last two years. So unlike in the West, there haven't been many measures in place. You see, I walk around without a face mask. Some people are wearing face masks again more than they used to in, in recent months, just because last month there were a few infections in Beijing. I don't know, a few dozens, uh, you know, like less than a thousand people in total got infected, but it was a bit scary. It was people getting nervous again, because over the last two years, most of the time, we had hardly any COVID patients in Beijing and all over China. The numbers were extremely low. They're still comparatively extremely low. I think there's less um, COVID infections in Shanghai than in Switzerland, even though Shanghai has four times the population of Switzerland. Um, so, 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 yeah, well, what's important to realize is how um, life has been almost normal. I mean, the, the biggest two things that I can think of in terms of COVID measures is one is in the subway and public transportation. You still do have to wear face masks and they're quite strict in the subway, meaning if you don't wear a face mask, uh, the employees will come to you and tell you like, hey, you have to put your face mask on correctly. Even if your nose sticks out, they tell you you have to put it on correctly. But it's not like... It's not an issue like I'd imagine in some Western countries where people get angry and say they like, refuse to put it on. And so I've never seen anyone like even debating that they have to put the face mask on. The most rebellious thing that some people do, mostly very old people, they tend to just let their face mask slip. And every time the employee tells them to put it on, they dutifully put it back on and then it slips down again once that person's gone. Um, but it's not in a, in a, in a like, aggressive way of like, no, I'm not going to do that or I don't want to wear a face mask. People don't care. It's really not an issue. Also, like when you see face masks, 90%, 99% are light blue or white. Uh, just typical one-way face masks. It's not like people don't feel like, oh, I look ugly wearing a face mask. It's just not a thing. It's like, yeah, you wear it and everybody else wears it. So why should you care? Um, so that's the one measure. Second measure is they have these uh, QR codes everywhere. And when you scan the QR code, it, it, it will register that you've been to a place. And at the same time, it also um, checks whether you have a COVID uh, record, whether you have like a positive test or, or fever or anything, if you have, or whether you have been to a place that was at risk. If that's the case, then when you scan the code, your phone will make an alarm sound and, and the, the display will turn red, like will show, show your COVID certificate in red colors and they won't let you in in two places. If, if everything's normal, then it's a green number or like a green, green screen and you can go in as normal. And the registration has the added benefit that it tracks people. So if they discover a COVID case, they can very easily trace back where has this person been. And then uh, also, I think that I've never like experienced it myself. They can also automatically find everybody else who was at the same location before and after that specific person has scanned a QR code in a specific location. So these codes are everywhere. They were uh, invented very, very quickly into the pandemic and they've done wonders in, in, in track and trace. It wasn't a, a privacy issue because for one, Chinese people don't have that much of a, a sentiment for, for data privacy. And on the other, at least what, uh, what they tell us is that the data is actually just stored on, on your own phone where you have been. Although there must be a back end. I don't really know the details, but what I'm honestly very convinced is nobody cares to trace your personal steps. There's no evil supervisor in a government office somewhere looking at where people are scanning stuff. And why do I know that? It's very simple because the police has our phone numbers anyways. Like any cell phone number is registered uh, with your passport or, or ID card. So if they want to find an ID card with a phone, 
they just trace the phone number. There's no need to trace a, a, a QR code tracking or anything. So, so it's an absurd idea that this is to supervise people because that kind of supervision exists anyway. So, and I think it's what I've never got in Europe. I mean, European police and much more secret services, especially CIA in Europe, they know the phone numbers of people as well. I mean, regular long-term phone contracts you also do with your passport. So obviously they can trace you if they want. So why are you worried about COVID tracing? It just doesn't make sense to me. But anyways, that's a political topic. I don't want to get into that, like do it however you want. I'm happy I've spent the last two years in China. And the reason why I'm happy is just simply because I did not experience these endless, endless COVID measures. I didn't, you know, live for months on end, not go into the office. We had, I think, two or three months in 2020 from like January when they first invented this idea of city lockdown and locked down Wuhan. Uh, then also the offices all across China uh, closed down and people would work from home. And that lasted, I think, until around April. I remember May, May holiday, May 1st holiday, um, Labor Day holiday in China. We were already traveling again. So by then, like the, the, the strict measures were over already. And just these light measures like QR codes. Let me show you one. Here's a QR code. So, so this is what you would scan. And that's, that's what it looks like uh, to go into places. So... Um, yeah, after like May 2020, that's all there was. And unless there's a city lockdown, because in one place a lot of cases come up, um, it, it, it wouldn't change. Like life would go on. Restaurants were open, movies were open. Um, they had uh, stricter measures in Xinjiang for a while because there were like several hundred cases. I think 21 spring, I'd say. Then in Xi'an, that city also in central western China, a former capital of several dynasties in, in ancient past. And um, yeah, now in the last two months, there have been several cities. I don't even know which one, all of them. There are several cities that have gone into lockdown again. So, so yeah, there have been measures again, but again, in total, most Chinese, let's make, I'd say 90%, haven't experienced a strict lockdown all right now let's be generous maybe 80 percent so if yeah i mean but think about the numbers china has 1.4 billion people 10 percent is 140 million so if we say 80 percent have not gone in lockdown that would mean 20 percent have experienced a strict lockdown that would be 280 million by comparison shanghai has less than 30 million and is one of the biggest cities in china so I cannot imagine like Shanghai, Xinjiang also around 20, 30 million. Um, yeah, I cannot imagine that there was more than 200 million Chinese who went into strict lockdown over the last two years. That means 80% definitely had just what I had as an experience. You know, some measures, sometimes a bit more strict, sometimes a bit less strict. And surely like for people with children, it was uh, tough because for a while there was schooling from home and internet all across china is excellent like even in remote places but definitely poor families they may have faced challenges for the children mainly because they live in very small apartments in, in expensive cities like beijing so that must have been quite tough not saying it wasn't tough on people but it wasn't as strenuous as I hear from family and friends back in Switzerland, like this always on and off at measures and, and the, 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 the severe damage to all kinds of businesses. There are businesses struggling and there were in 2020, especially in like the uh, like food, restaurant businesses, entertainment businesses. Um, they, they did some measures like um, cutting their or, or releasing their, them from, from rent payment. 
which then triggered backlash from the from the building owners because they felt why are they paying for it so i'm not saying it wasn't challenging for the economy or it wasn't challenging for some people what i'm saying is overall the zero covid strategy for the vast majority of common people was very very convenient very helpful because it just impacted our life so much less because we didn't have this extreme and prolonged period of half-baked measures it's either full or nothing and um what else i've seen a like a headline in some newspapers i think it was german but i'll i'll, I'll see if i can find it um saying that surprisingly shanghai uh, allows criticism uh, about its covid measures which yeah it's just typical stereotypical uh, prejudice um that no criticism was allowed i mean yeah you cannot go when there's a full lockdown and you're not allowed to be on the streets you cannot then go and film a hospital and and you know argue and fight with the guards if they don't let you in because you want to film the patients in the hospital i mean <laughs> that's what happened in wuhan to this so-called um, civil journalist that then got imprisoned or or taken in custody for just breaching the law very simple and attacking uh, guards um so yeah that's not possible but you can complain a lot i mean there's all kinds of places where you can complain there's you know there's the chinese version of tiktok where people uh, create short videos uh, complaining about their their situation there are tons of other social media where people you know if they complain they have no reason to say like xi jinping must go or the communist party is evil that would be absurd because it's not what people experience it's things like shit i have no food at home and they suspended the delivery services and they don't let me go outside what can i do that's a problem and if they're angry they're angry at the authority that made such a rule and this authority obviously is the local authority so in shanghai there've been a lot of complaints about the shanghai authorities by shanghainese uh, because it caught them off guard it was not well communicated and also when i speak to friends in shanghai both from switzerland and from from china yeah they're worried they're they're angry and worried and um, especially when they see pictures from the from the quarantine they made like these huge quarantine centers and everyone who's positive covid positive gets sent there these pictures are horrible i mean you know they're not horrible in the sense of evil of people are trying to harm them but just in the sense of like a huge hall with beds where you're not protected from if you just have you know like a false positive test you get there and next to you without any uh, any separation there's people who actually do have covid you're absolutely certain to get infected there because there's just no separation between people and then videos where they complain that there's no water uh, they cannot wash their faces and it, it's just it's not something you want to experience um and it's given the resources given the population density given the situation overall i understand why they do it this way but i also understand that as an individual you want to do everything to avoid getting sent there which then serves as an incentive for people to really observe the the lockdown and not go on the streets to really avoid getting infected and getting discovered as infected if they are so these are some things that i hear from shanghai um but yeah what i was going to say is that now uh, this criticism is allowed is not something that surprises me and also what I, i don't know if this been reported there were like more than 100 officials in wuhan who got fired also in xian the other city that had a lockdown recently that wasn't well organized yeah people get fired i don't i haven't heard of a single politician or or like a state official in in the west that got fired over uh, botched covid measures but in china hundreds have been kicked out and you know it sounds like well kicked out that's not a punishment if they're not even in prison yeah m- maybe they're not in prison i don't know if they are but maybe they're not um but if you built your life around being a- an employee of the government and it's quite an honor in china that the examination you have to pass 
is like uh, ten thousands of applicants per available position. So it's a hugely competitive job. And if you get kicked out because your COVID response wasn't done well, that's a huge impact on your whole family. So I'm really like n not feeling that they didn't get punished enough. So, so, so yeah, there there are repercussions in China if you're an official and you don't do your job well. That's gonna hurt you. And I think that's maybe one reason why the Chinese trust their government so much because people in power in China, they are worried to, of, of making mistakes. They want to really avoid making mistakes because they know if they, if they make too big mistakes, if they get caught, they get really seriously in trouble. And um, that on one hand increases the performance of those people. On the other hand, it also gives a sense of justice to people. So they, they feel like, okay, uh, we've suffered from a not well-organized lockdown, but all right, at least a, a, a certain amount of, certain number of officials got kicked out for it. So it's kind of a sense of justice also for the ruling people, which, yeah, I'm not gonna talk about the West anymore today. Actually, I think I'm gonna end it here. I've been walking, I hope you've seen some of the background, you see some of the, uh, environment, different sizes of roads. Again, this is not like a central place of Beijing, but it's also not a far outskirt. It's it's around what we call the fourth ring. So fourth ring road. Um, and yeah, life goes on as normal in Beijing. Let's hope it stays this way. Let's hope normal life returns to Shanghai as well very soon. Thanks for watching. And if you enjoyed it, please give me a like, share, uh, give me comments if you like or don't like it. Tell me what to improve. Looking forward to seeing you again in the next one. Bye.